So Evan Clark, in addition to being the executive director of Atheist United, uh, Evan is also the founder and creative director of Spectrum Experience LLC. Uh, he's the North American coordinator for Young Humanists International and the California State Director for American Atheists. Uh, previously, he was on the board of directors of the Secular Student Alliance, uh, co-host of the Humanist Experience podcast, and was co-founder of the Humanist Community of Ventura County. Uh, as a student leader, Evan was the founder and president of the Secular Student Alliance at California Lutheran University. And in 2010, Evan was actually elected as CLU's first openly atheist student body president uh, at a religious institution, nonetheless. Uh, so uh, go ahead and take it away, our esteemed presenter, Evan. Okay, awesome. Thank you all for coming. I can share screen here in two seconds, but um, yeah, this is my third and final presentation for the Secular Student Alliance. The last two, I uh, had the opportunity to speak about uh, media and getting attention, and then we did one on fundraising. Uh, I like talking about both of those topics. I have backgrounds in both of those topics, but this is actually my favorite topic, uh, community building. And the reason for that is because this is the hardest of the three. Uh, fundraising is hard because it's annoying and it's like awkward in our society. Media attention, again, it's annoying. People are weird about it. But community building, we don't have experts in this space. We do not have 2,000 years of practice at the same level as some of the institutions that you might consider yourself cultural competitors to. Um, we do not have the funding and the institutional backing of a lot of the organizations that have uh, religious organizations on your campus, off campus, influencing our politics and more. Um, just to put into perspective, the Secular Student Alliance has a budget under a million dollars a year. Campus Crusade for Christ spends a half billion dollars a year on their organization. They support over 2,000 groups around the world. Um, they, unlike the SSA, who has like two staff for hundreds of campuses, we're talking about like three staff for every campus, and there's 2,000 plus campuses that they are representing. Um, we are so outgunned financially if it was a direct competition. Um, and I'll explain in a second why it's not always a direct competition, but um, we as a demographic of people, as secular, non-religious, questioning, whatever you want to call yourself, especially in your age demographic, are making up anywhere between one in three to one in two people on every college campus. Like you walk into a room and every third person you're going to sit next to is likely questioning or religion or is non-religious like you are. Um, this is a massive opportunity for community organizing. And before I jump into this, um, I have to speak to its value. Um, you're going to hear from advocacy organizations the rest of your life, why they're important. You're going to get fundraising letters from them. You're going to support organizations like that. Uh, and you hear the most from them because they have a lot to say about the problems with the world and how they're working to fix them. Um, we all know about things like Christian nationalism. We all know about reproductive rights being stripped. We all know about the attacks in the gay community. We all know how climate change is somehow getting mixed up with, you know, uh, these people who believe they can fix it all in heaven or something. Um, and, and that's true. We need to fight the people that are oppressing us in that way. Uh, and we need to get secular values into the world. But people forget that gathering in a group of people and regularly communing, regularly talking to each other, regularly supporting each other has value in and of itself. There is overwhelming research that people who attend churches and synagogues and mosques live longer, volunteer more, are happier, and report higher levels of, uh, of, of uh, community service and volunteering. But if you dig into the study, it has nothing to do with belief. It, it is a completely secular concept. It is how often you participate in community. And that fits with thousands of other studies that say the more you hang out with other people, the longer you live, the happier you are, the um, the less depression you have, the, the more you volunteer, the more you donate to charity. We as organizers, just by getting people together, are helping the world. You're literally improving the lives of everyone around you just by gathering. Yes, we want to do advocacy on top of that. Yes, we have a million things we need to change in the world. But do not forget the value of just getting everybody in a room and recognizing that we're there together. All right, let's start with that. Uh, real quick, 
I've done this with every one of my talks. I'm gonna do it again here. Tell me thumbs up if you can see this. Awesome. This is my contact info. I am giving you all my contact info free. I am encouraging you to contact me at any time. Uh, most speakers will not do this, uh, but I am giving you full permission to contact me because you never know how the people you meet will impact your life in the future. Uh, whether this is luck or determinism can be up to you. Um, but for me, anytime I go to a conference, anytime I host a speaker, I get to know them and I get their information. Um, my business partner, who I started my PR and political consulting firm with, I met at a Secular Student Alliance conference in 2012. Uh, the reason I was hired at Atheist United in 2019 was because I became friends with the first speaker I hosted as a student group. Um, she came and spoke at our campus. And then seven years later, because I kept in touch with her when they were looking to hire someone for our local community, I was able to insert myself into the conversation. All I did was take this woman out to lunch a few times over seven years. You have the ability to insert yourself into amazing opportunities to work with people who inspire you if you just keep in touch with them. Um, so I'm giving you permission right now to write me, to ask questions, to follow up, to follow me. Um, all you have to do is mention that you're a Secular Student Alliance student, and I will bump you to the top of the list of my priorities. I owe so much of my current leadership opportunities to what I learned being an SSA student, and uh, I hope I can help you all uh, do the same. Um, I hope I'm the first of many thousands of people who have jobs like mine, um, but until we do, I'm going to pass on what I've learned. So today I'm going to give you about nine tips on community organizing. These are things that I've learned over the past 14 years that I've been tinkering with secular communities. Um, I've run communities at the student level, at the adult off-campus level. I've worked with national organizations. I've worked with political campaigns. Um, and I think we <laughs> don't talk enough about how we hire mostly lobbyists and lawyers and not enough community organizers. Um, community organizing is a skill, just like any other professional skill in the world. If you were to try to work for a major grassroots organization like a Planned Parenthood or Sunrise Foundation, most of the people that work for those organizations um, that aren't the doctors or lobbyists in like a Planned Parenthood are community organizers. They're taking groups of people, they're bringing them together and then trying to do something. That's all community organizing is. If you are good at talking to people, bringing them together, and then doing things together with them, you can be a community organizer. And just by taking a leadership role in a local community on your campus, by running a club, whether you like it or not, you are learning how to be a community organizer. So everything I'm gonna to say today applies to that mindset of how do we organize a community? How do we bring people together and, and make an impactful community for them? But what's unique is we're doing it from a secular perspective. We're doing it without religious tradition. We're doing it without institutions like the Catholic Church or the Lutheran Church or your, your synagogue um, supporting you. We don't have money. We don't have pastors and rabbis and uh, monks that are going to be there to support us. And so, and we have something unique. We are, a lot of our identities, like atheists, sometimes humanists, are really disliked in our society. Like they are some of the most politicized terms in our society. So we're gonna talk about all of those today. All right, first, the concept of pluralism. Um, if you've never heard this before, go ahead and Google it right now so that you have it up on a tab when we're done. Um, I wanna talk about how most people think that when we are organizing, we are on this spectrum between theism and atheism, right? That we are in a fight, this fight for the end times, right, between atheists and theists, and that the, you know, every every Christian or Muslim that you talk to is like, you know, we must overcome all of these godless atheists or other people of different religions, and they kind of start making you think in this supremacist mindset that it is an us versus them and we must win. I'm going to tell you this is bullshit. This has always been bullshit, and you've been taught this by religious people. Uh, this is a religious concept that we can reject as non-religious people. Um, it was never a fight between theism and atheism. That is, there is a spectrum of beliefs, and we are on one end of it. But what we don't want once you're atheist is to be a supremacist. We don't actually want to oppress theists and have us be the only one with special rights. 
That's what Christian nationalists want. That's what Muslim nationalists want, right? What we really want is pluralism. We want everyone to exist equally in society. We want the same freedom of religion and freedom from religion for everyone. And this is pretty obvious if you think for two seconds about it. If you had a choice between standing with an atheist who happened to have Nazi beliefs or with a Christian who had beliefs like Martin Luther King on how to improve the world, who would you choose to work with? For me, it's really simple. I'm going to go hang out with the Martin Luther King dude. Um, I'm going to fight oppressive systems and stand in solidarity with people, even if they have a different identity with me, because they share my values. Um, you will meet atheists who are atheist supremacists. Uh, there are people out there who have learned the wrong thing as they have lost religion. They have learned from the theism they used to have that you're supposed to have power over the other groups, that you're supposed to be better than them, that you're suddenly smarter than them um, with your identity. I want to challenge you to reject those ideas. You need to start looking at everyone as human beings that have mushy evolved brains. They're monkeys in shoes. And we're all just trying to figure out our way through the world. And what we really want is equality for everyone. And if we're not fighting for equality, ultimately, we're the other side of that spectrum would be totalitarianism. So this is the real fight we're having as community organizers. And when you look at the world this way, suddenly religious groups can be your partners. Um, as an organizer, you're going to need partners along the way, whether that be for political legitimacy, whether that be for organizing and resources. Um, and if we limit ourselves to only working with atheists because we believe we're better than other people, we're going to wind up like the totalitarian. Uh, totalitarianism, the supremacist ideas that, frankly, we were taught by religious groups. So this is the first challenge I have for all of you, because when I joined Atheists United, my current job, and I looked at the social media path posts of the past 15 years that they had on their Facebook. When I speak to some of the community members that are in my community and I ask them, why are they here? They say, because we need to end religious belief in society, because we are better and smarter than religious people and we need to fix them. Those ideas are religious ideas. And I want to challenge us that from a secular perspective, we can move to pluralistic ideas and we will find tons of partners. This is why I work with religious people actually a lot. I do a lot of interfaith work is because I have a pluralistic perspective. Um, maybe uh, interpersonally, maybe uh, philosophically, you agree that believing magic is bad and we should stop that in people. But when it comes to community organizing, if that's all your organization is about, you're going to wind up with uh, attracting supremacists. So I just want you to be careful with that. All right. Number two is politics of community. So when I took the job at Atheist United um, and identify, I personally identify as a humanist, an atheist, a questioning person. I'm not big on the labels thing, which I can talk about later in the Q&A if you'd like. Um, I am all of these identities, and I also don't care much about these identities. I'm, I'm here to help people. I organize around values, but um, I took a job with an organization called Atheist United, and atheist is clearly a very big word in our society, very disliked word. Even a lot of non-religious people do not like the word atheist um, because of the baggage it has in our society. And when I was talking to our board of directors about all the events we do, all the programs we do, I kept asking them, why do we do these? What is the reason our organization exists? Do we exist to fight for atheist identity politically, right? Like make us equal under the law, fight separation, fight for separation of church and state. And we should be putting all of our time and energy into politics, essentially. Or are we a community organization? Like I talked about at the beginning, are we bringing people together? Are we providing socials? Are we helping them um, work on the, the little needs they're dealing with in their life? And ultimately, we came to the conclusion that no matter how much you try to depoliticize community, society has deemed everything you do political. Um, so you just need to know this going into it. Taking an identity like atheist or humanist in our society, whether you like it or not, is an inherently political act. This is the same thing with being queer or being a woman in our society, right? These identities have been politicized by oppressors in our society. And if you don't recognize that, you're going to get shell-shocked. You're going to be slapped in the face by a world that suddenly won't work with you at times or will actively be hostile to you. Um, and you can then recognize that when people are trying to force your community to just be political, you can respond and recognize that just by us gathering and supporting each other, 
is an inherently political act. When you think about the LGBT movement and its early history, it wasn't all marches, it wasn't all building community centers. You have to think about how often they were building safe spaces just for themselves to keep other people out. But that is a radically political act. Providing safety for a group of people in a dangerous world is a political act, okay? So just be comfortable with this language. Uh, the Secular Student Alliance has language that they use when they talk about programming and events you can do. Uh, they have something called CASE. CASE is an acronym, uh, Community Advocacy Service and Education. Um, I'm sure one of the staff can put a link to that in the chat while I'm talking. Um, I like personally to take service and education and look at those as tools of community and advocacy. Um, if I try to ground everything down to like, what is the real core of everything we're doing? To me, it's always community and advocacy. Um, the danger though of doing both all the time is you are going to be everything to everyone, um, which I'll, I'll come to at the end. You want to pick the thing that you're more focused on. Are you more focused on providing a safe, awesome, kick-ass community for people? Or are you more focused on changing X, Y, Z thing about the world? Um, pick one that is your priority. You will have to use community to accomplish your political goals, and you will have to interact with politics to accomplish your community goals. Um, there's no way around this, but for you to do good community, you just have to recognize that sometimes it is an act of advocacy, whether you intended for it to be or not. All right, this is probably the most important thing I'm going to teach you today, um, belonging versus growth. So when people join a community and you ask them why are they joining a community, nine times out of 10, they will tell you they're looking for belonging. I'm looking for other people like me. I'm looking for a place to gather where I can know that I'm not alone. I'm not the only one. And we see this all the time. Uh, in my 14 years of doing this, I have consistently hosted events where people will come and check it out. And I will ask them, why are you here? And they go, oh, well, I think I might be a humanist. I think I might be questioning. Uh, maybe this is a space for me. Humans are looking for spaces with like-minded people. This is just a human trait. Uh, we need to recognize this as organizers. But people don't stay for belonging. I really, really, really think we need to learn this as community organizers. People will check you out because they're curious and they're looking for other people like them. But why would you stay in that group if it didn't share your values, if it didn't help you grow as a human being? I think if we can move from identity, things like atheists and humanists and non-religious as the only way we talk about our community and the focus of our programs, to values, like what we're actually trying to accomplish and why, we will be able to speak to people at a deeper level, right? If I'm organizing just around identity, I put up a billboard and go, hey, atheists are hanging out at lunch. A bunch of people get together, they come to lunch and they go, cool, we're all atheists. And then they go, now what? <laughs> and if you don't have an answer to that, now what? They will not come back. So your job as a community organizer is to come up with ways to improve their lives. And the easiest way to do this, this is super simple, is find the needs they have as a human being. What are the needs that they are trying to address? Are they dealing with depression? Are they dealing with addiction? Are they dealing with um, loneliness? Are they dealing with curiosity? And they're looking for places to learn? Are they... Are they broke and they need help networking? Like, what is the need that the humans that interact in your group have? If you can address those and connect them to your values, if you can help somebody find a job, find a partner, find, get help in the hospital when they're sick, help them raise their kids, help them uh, pick the best uh, career or classes, if you can help them navigate debts or some of the complex things you deal with, you can just find one or two of those things, you will change your life. Now, when you're your age, not my age, belonging is actually a bigger need than it is uh, when you're older. Uh, <laughs> this is weird. I know this is counterintuitive to everything I just told you, but like you just joined a new university, right? If you are new to a school and you don't know anyone, belonging is the first thing you have to figure out. But whether you join that club for one year or four years is whether that club continues to address your needs, right? For a lot of us, that's curiosity. Um, when I was in college, uh, 
people would join our club because they were intrigued. They were interested. They were looking for belonging. Um, but we always had a really good discussion topic and then a really interesting event that they could look forward to. And they found that the events were fun and they found that the discussions helped them learn about something they didn't know before. Suddenly, we tickled their curiosity. We helped them grow educationally and we provided fun spaces for them to gather, which they also needed. I, <laughs> we all need those, period. But especially when you're in college and you're new to college and you don't know anyone. Um, finding friends is a need you have when in college, right? Having a group of people that you know you can count on for your existential conversations is a need you have in college. You can provide that with your club. All right, let's keep moving. Um, create FOMO. Uh, if you've never heard this phrase, this is fear of missing out. Uh, fear of missing out. So a lot of people talk about like Instagram this way. A lot of Instagram influencers are creating FOMO, right? They go on a trip to a cool place. They hike a mountain, they post a video and they're creating this like, oh man, I wish I could have participated. I, I If there's an upcoming event, you want to create this like fear of missing out for people. Um, so Fear of missing out is absurd if we just think about it as like a base concept of like, we're constantly creating fear in people. What we're really trying to do is inspire excitement and urgency. We want to create events and we want to create excitement for them around things we're doing. Um, and we want to make them so exciting that they want to share with their friends. So exciting that they want to overcome the objections getting in the way from them attending. This is a great tip for you in life. The difference between planning an event that's like, eh, it's fun, versus like, it's so freaking exciting that I will be sad if I don't go. If we can get to that level, you will be an amazing organizer. People will check out your events. Um, and I have a great tip for doing this before I get into all the ways we can hack this. Um, my biggest tip, and some of you have heard this on my previous presentations, is stack two exciting things. So instead of saying, we're going to host a speaker, we're going to host a speaker and we're going to go to, uh get ice cream uh at a really cool restaurant afterwards right like do two things that people are excited about and you go from that's interesting to that's something i really don't want to miss out on um so just constantly be thinking about that and here are all the things you can like hack right the why the who the what the where the when these are all places you can try to make more exciting with every event you do um, the where, can you move it to a more exciting location, a more memorable location, a more media hungry location? Um, the what, can you make the topic instead of just like, here's how brains work. Like, here's how brains work when thinking about sex, right? Like, find some way to make it way more exciting for people and, and fits with things they're already interested about. Um, the who, right? The the target audience. Make sure the people there are really exciting. Um the when, can you plan it instead of having a party near Halloween, can you have a Halloween party, right? Like that might make it much more exciting. So these are things that you can hack when thinking about your events. And the more exciting things you can stack on top of each other, the more people want to come. Um, I'm doing this in my local community right now. Uh, we decided a few years ago, we wanted to start doing some like outdoor activities. And so we talked about doing a camping trip. And then we were like, screw it, that's not good enough. Let's do a camping trip in an epic national park like Death Valley. Awesome, right? Nope, not good enough. Let's do it on a moonless night and bring an astronomer to do a star talk in Death Valley. Now I've created FOMO. Suddenly tickets started really selling for that event and people came. So the more you can stack for exciting, the easier it is to sell and the more people will want to come. All right. This is also critical. You will use this the rest of your life. Do not be everything to everyone. I know this is obvious when I say it, right? Like it sounds intuitive. Oh, you can't be everything to everyone. Um, but I want to talk about what this looks like. Um, when you take over a group or when you're starting a group, you're going to have people who come in the door and check out your events and maybe start acting like they want to be leaders who maybe aren't your target audience. Um, they start telling, complaining about things you're doing. They start saying, ah, I want this to be a political group, even though 90% of you want this to be a community group, right? They start saying, ah, well, I hate that you're posting it in the student union because that's on the far side of campus from me, even though that's where most of the people you want there, it's accessible for. Um, think about who your target audience is and do everything you can for them. Um, and that means sometimes 
making choices to be uninviting to people who don't fit that bill. A common problem in a lot of adult atheist communities right now is what I'm going to call the that that dude. Um, it's usually like an older, retired white guy who has a lot of sexist comments. Um, toxic for communities. These are terrible people. They constantly show up because they have nowhere else to go. They have a few things they like to think about and talk about, like science and atheism. But when it comes to interacting with everyone else in the community, they make toxic comments that makes everyone else uncomfortable to the point where a lot of women will stop coming to your community, right? They they feel a need to debate everything publicly and loudly, even if the event was designed to be like a children's day in the park, not a philosophy get together. Um, if you organize the event to be a philosophy day in the park, right, that's fine. If you organize it to be a children's day in the park for families and he comes and wants to debate everyone on trans rights, no. You don't want the group to be inviting to that attitude and that person. Um, so don't be everything to everyone. People will complain, oh, no, there's only 10 of us. And if we lose one of them, we might not have much of a community anymore. Remember, we're small. We don't have money. Sometimes the groups we're planning have very few people. That is a terrible attitude. Um, instead, put all your time and energy into the people you want to build this around and be OK to lose the people who don't fit that. It will feel like a loss for a short period of time, but you will realize that your group is so much more inviting to the people you want to be there. The people who leave can go create their own group. Um, the problem, that, the pressure comes from the fact that we don't have any other secular groups on campus. It comes from the fact that I'm organizing in Los Angeles and there's only three other groups like ours. So we feel like if we shrink, right, there's no options for anyone. But that's a scarcity mindset. We don't have to have that. If they really want to create the Republican Atheist Club, let them go create that where they can go debate everybody's human rights. Um, if your group doesn't want to debate human rights, don't debate human rights. Just know what your values are and stick to them. Um, if your group wants to be the one that debates human rights, that's fine. Be that group. But know that you're not going to have a lot of people who maybe identify with the group you're questioning the rights of. <laughs> cool. Awesome. Um, and again, Ways you can do this, target, 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 like think about who you're organizing for. And here's a pro tip, it's you. You're trying to organize for other people like you. If you're ever curious what your target audience is like and what they like to do and where they spend their time, start with you. Where do you like to spend your time? Where are you and your friends going? What are the things you're talking about? What are the events you wanna do? It's the easiest thing in the world, um, especially on a college campus. There are way more people like you than you think. Um, you just have to start promoting that. Um, other things you can do is provide delight and excitement and, and good memories for other people in that target audience. Um, again, if you have a sexist guy constantly coming to your events, to me, I like to make it undelightful for him. I want to make it uncomfortable so where he stops coming. <laughs> um, but I want to make it so comfortable and exciting for the people that we want there. Um, accessible. There's two concepts here. There's accessible in like the everyone should be able to walk through the door, which means like wheelchair accessible or sound accessible. Yes, you should prioritize that as like a value of your community. Um, but you also don't want to over prioritize the wrong people by making it mostly accessible to the wrong people. Um, you, people who want to pull your community a different direction will fight like hell for you to go that direction. Um, and the way to fight that is make it easier and more exciting for the target group you want. This is a bigger issue in groups like mine, where I have age diversity from 20 year olds to 80 year olds, um, where like if I have a beach volleyball event, it is inherently more accessible to young people who can jump and hit volleyballs. Right. Um, and if I hold a like uh, a I don't know, a bingo night at a retirement center, like that's much more accessible to the people living in that retirement center uh, than you as a young person has to drive across town after work. Um, or if I hold an event midday, people who have jobs can't, uh, it's less accessible for people who have day jobs to attend those events. Um, consistency is just a good concept This is on here. And then um, you want to empower the right people. If a good person comes to your event, person that you think would make a great leader do not be shy about talking to them about that. Go up to them and go, hey, I think you agree with our vision and values. I think you're a great fit for this organization. I'd love to see you take on more responsibility. I'd love to see uh, you and your friends get more involved. Like, 
just start an open dialogue with them. Uh, the more responsibility you give people, it usually inspires more participation. And this is counterintuitive. I think we think that if we we dump a lot on people, they're going to start backing off. Um, that'll happen sometimes. But if you find somebody who's as excited about this as you are, the more you give them, the more involved they'll get. Um, I find that people very rarely have limits if they're in love with what they're doing. Um, so give them an opportunity to get involved. Okay, number six, be visionary. Um, so I ran a secular student group for three and a half years in college. And then when I got out of school, I wanted to start a humanist group locally in Ventura County, California. This is just north of Los Angeles. Um, I did something, I, I made a mistake that most leaders do. Um, I had a big gathering of a bunch of alumni and a bunch of uh, community members. I had like 20 of us get together in a house. I had us all go around and talk about, hey, what do you all want to do with the community? And for two hours, we went around, we wrote down all these ideas. And then we're like, cool, let's get together two weeks from now and like, see where we can go with these. And then we got together two weeks later, and we had the exact same conversation. We spent two hours going around the room. We we're trying to be as egalitarian as possible like no leaders we're just going to figure this out together and because no one was leading the meeting and there wasn't a big vision for where we were going we just kept talking in circles we just kept throwing out ideas but not actually doing anything with them finally an old guy who uh had come to both meetings pulled me aside and he said evan you're you're doing this all wrong right if you were a young religious leader trying to start a new church you would never ask everyone else what they want to do and go around for two meetings in a row for four hours and just get everyone's opinions. You would start the meeting with, hey, everyone, I have this awesome vision for a community I want to build. Here's these big ideas and ways I want to impact the world and ways I want to help people. Will you all come along on that journey with me? And if you just change that frame from uh, constant uh what do you call it input to visionary uh like creating a strong vision people will want to follow uh and this doesn't mean you need to ab abuse them like a cult leader and make them follow every little thing you need to do but what it does is it aligns everyone in a direction and that's what we're trying to do as a visionary leader we're trying to get everybody focused the same direction and so what i did with that advice is i suddenly started telling everyone in my community that someday we're going to own a building that we're going to call the Humanist, uh, the Humanist Community Center of Ventura County that we're going to be able to host all of our events in, where we can have a youth group and we can have big potlucks and we can do community service projects in. And I had no idea what that would look like. I don't know how much that would cost. I don't know if that's like 50 years down the road or five years down the road. But I started telling people that this was the vision of the community. This is what we're working towards. And within a year, people started to repeat it. Um, I, we used to do these dinners. We used to do like a monthly dinner meetup and we just pick a restaurant meetup. And I had people who came for a year, stopped coming for a year and then came back to the group. They like moved out of the area and then moved back to the area. And the first question they would ask me when they rejoined is, how are you doing on your goal to build that community center? Like a good vision is sticky and will ground everyone in a direction. And it's your job as a leader to give people that direction, to remind people constantly about that direction. So it can be really tangible, like a community center, um, or it can be like some change in the world you want to see, right? Like no um, child is abused by religious oppression in the future, what, whatever it might be. That's the like bolder, bigger version, right? That religious trauma is not something college students ever have to face again. Um, or that, you know, loneliness after leaving religion is never something a college student will have to face. Like, Pick a vision that excites you, that excites other people, and try to point people that direction. This has been super helpful for me. All right, this one's simple. Uh, take photos, take videos, and brag. Uh, one reason is really easy. We need to promote ourselves. We have to get out into the world. We have to show people the cool things we're doing. Um, but the second, whether you recognize it or not, everything you are doing right now is a part of a narrative. It is part of a history. It's part of a social movement. And if we don't document what we're doing, the historians of tomorrow will not be able to know that there was a student group doing awesome shit on your campus and that it was a part of hundreds of other groups doing awesome shit across the world. People forget that every social movement in human history has to build narratives around their history. Um, the LGBT movement has been doing really 
good work with this over the past 20 years is starting to capture their history and turn it into narratives that the leaders of today can use when inspiring and talking to other people. Stonewall, that was not common knowledge by everyone 30 or 40 years ago. That is something that historians work to then capture and modern activists turned into relevant history for our culture to understand. What we're doing with the Secular Student Alliance, this idea that we can build spaces for secular non-religious people to gather, the idea that we are challenging religious privilege in schools and in our culture and in our cities, the idea that we are building alternatives to religious ritual, the idea that we are um, encouraging new traditions, everything from uh, queer weddings to environmentally friendly burials, right? This is the legacy of what we're doing that we don't even recognize the impact of today. Um, and so I want to encourage you to document it. Um, photos are great for you, but photos are really good for getting other people excited. And then the third part, people just like to see themselves. Um, when you're bragging, like, it's like the local newspaper. Everyone wants to see their name in the local newspaper. It just feels good. Um, people want to see their, their photo when they volunteer. Uh, they want to put that on their social media, right? If they did something awesome, you want to give them the opportunity to share that. Sometimes you're going to create a group that's providing safety, right? I know a lot of you are organizing in the South and maybe your roommates or your family, you do not want to know about the conversations you're having because you're questioning religion, because you're talking about their the organizations they support as being terrible for the world. I get that. Um, but the more you can document, I really think the more tools you have in your toolkit for uh, getting other people excited and keeping your current people excited. So uh, please, please, please take photos and videos and then if able, promote. All right, this one's uh, really important, especially once you're my age, but I think it applies to you all. We do not know the best way to organize secular community. If I did, I would just be telling you that right now. If I knew the perfect program that you could do, I would tell you. If I knew what would get 100 people to show up every time, I would tell you. Um, we have to address the world we live in. I took over Atheist United in 2019, and this organization was founded in 1982. 1980s atheism and humanism is so radically different than 2023 atheism and humanism, right? To be an out atheist in Los Angeles in 2003 is a very dangerous act. Uh, you could lose your job. You could lose your spouse. You could um, jeopardize um, your funding for your university if you're at a private school and have a church scholarship, right? Like there are so many ways in which this identity was the complete focus of the advocacy. And many of you that live in the South probably feel this right now, right? Like I, I call this the spectrum of atheist identity, right? Like if you come out as queer and atheist in Kentucky, rural Kentucky, it is just night and day different than growing up in a secular family in California, in Los Angeles, where like you go to a university where most people are secular, you get a job at Netflix where most people are religious, like it's not a topic you even need to discuss where like you have to live and breathe it in a lot of states in the United States, especially rural parts. Um, but what that means is we have to come up with innovative programs. We have to come up with interesting events. We have to find ways to address the needs of the people around us. And we have to experiment. Um, your job as organizers is to throw spaghetti at the wall and see what sticks. And this sucks. But this means you're going to fail. <laughs> you're going to throw an event that almost no one is gonna show up at. You are going to plan a press conference that no media is gonna cover. You are going to try out a project and a partnership that is going to not work out or, or even get negative press that you're gonna have to deal with. Um, but if you keep experimenting, you will find things that work and you will be able to pass them on to the future leaders that take over your group. Um, we are in a very, very weird time as organizers. Uh, I forget if that's my, yeah. We are in a media revolution, right? Like trying to describe 2023 to someone in 1990 is impossible. You know, they, like the concept of TikTok, the concept of, of like Instagram, the concept that like the idea that 
there will probably be a new social media a year or two from now that will be massive. And we know that that's coming, but we don't know what it is, is unbelievable, right? Media took huge steps that often took hundreds of years between those steps. The invention of the printing press, the invention of the radio, the invention of the television. We're in the social media era. We have the internet and change is happening so quick that we don't know how we're going to be communicating five years from now. We don't. Like WhatsApp wasn't a thing 10 years ago. <laughs> when I was in college, there wasn't a WhatsApp. There are countries' elections now being decided by WhatsApp group communications. Um, so this is why we have to innovate. We have to constantly be thinking about where people are. We have to constantly be thinking about what their needs are. Um, you know, the way we talk about a loneliness epidemic today in America uh, with new technology, the way our cities are designed, the lack of third places, right? Like people didn't think about those 10 or 20 years ago the way we have to today. Um, so we have to constantly innovate or our group becomes irrelevant. Um, so a lot of our groups that were founded in the 80s and 90s, they are really struggling today because they still want to do print newsletters and send them out to everyone. I don't know about you, but I've never gotten a print newsletter in my life and I don't want one. <laughs> Stop mailing me shit. Um, emails. Emails were the way to communicate 10 years ago. Not really a thing. Same way today, right? Uh, text messages are a big thing of this era, but they might not be five to 10 years from now. So your job is to innovate. And then here's just some quick hacks. Uh, this is my favorite hack, I think, for getting people to attend things, especially when you're young. Just feed people. Give them free food. This one's the simplest thing you could ever do. Uh, you know, buy a bunch of popcorn at Costco and have popcorn at every meeting. Go get some donuts. Get some ice cream. See if Turn it into a potluck, your meetings. Um, food is one of the cheapest, simplest, and most enjoyable ways to build community. Um, Humans have gathered around food since forever, and I don't see that changing until we have Star Trek, you know, food machines. So uh, use food to your benefit. Um, I've given a lot of other talks on like how to build uh, a really good meeting space. I've given talks about how to give throw really exciting events. So I can speak to all of those, but um, we just need to get a few base things right. And this one, <laughs> you'll see in religion, you'll see in secular communities, uh, you can do this. Food, 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 food. Um, okay, with that, I want to open it up to everyone. I want to hear about the community building attempts you're doing on campus. I want to have your deep, scary fears about community building, the existential thoughts and questions you have around, can we build secular rituals? How do we actually address people's human needs? What are they? Um, let's have that conversation because you are the group that is going to innovate um, how people like me community organize over the next 10 years. Uh, I meet adults all the time who are constantly like, why aren't young people joining my groups? And I always want to slap them upside the head and go, look, if, if I see a secular student leader, they've been trained on how to market their group, on how to bring in speakers on how to work with the national organization. Lots of them create budgets and work with bureaucracies like their organ, like their university. You know, if, if you become a good club leader, you have all the skills necessary to be an off-campus leader, to, to lead organizations, nonprofits, community groups. And, um, you know, my goal is to help you as much as possible do that in your student years, but you should be thinking bigger you have the capacity to influence a lot more than your student group if you just continue to um, address the needs in front of you. The needs will change, but the skills won't. Okay. Huzzah. Lots of talking. All right. So uh, some of you I remember from last week, uh, especially some of you new folks, um, what are you dealing with on your campus? What do you want to do? What have you attempted to do? And what questions are you running into? What challenges are you running into? And let's, as a group, see if we can kind of hack solutions for them. See if we can come up with some creative ideas, um, learn from each other, tell some stories of failure. Those are always good. Uh, hey, it's Jesse. Uh, yeah. Um, oh. yeah, so I, I have a lot of networking with a lot of groups like FFRF, Americans United, um, Central Free Flow down in Florida, um, the American, you know, American Atheists. And 
I've been reaching out to them and doing interviews with some of them, uh, like Aaron Raw and uh, Seth Andrews, and sure. asking them what you now why people should join Secure um, uh, the uh, Student Alliance. And uh, I posted those to my social media. I shared them with everybody else who wanted them, and they can share them to their social media. But I'll be going to FFRF next week, and I'm hoping to get a couple more interviews with you know people that um, the students should get to know as they get out of college, these groups and these people, these authors, these lawyers, and some of these activists that – you know, get out there and get the word of, um, you know, for decons, for people who are deconverting or, you know, that, that these resources that they need out there. So that's the that's kind of stuff that I've been doing. Okay. Um, so are, are you in a student group? Sorry, I didn't catch that. Or are you with an off-campus group? Uh, no, I'm, well, I'm, I'm getting a PhD right now. So, oh, <laughs> yeah, no. yeah, so a little bit older, yeah, a little bit wiser. Oh, but, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> And uh, yeah, so but, you know, being at VCU, I'm able to kind of, you know, kind of give a little more insight to some of the younger students, you know, as to what they have to look forward to after they get out, you know, and have that networking starting for them already. You know, I've, I've already got a lot of people that, you know, are willing to come talk to them, you know, Andrew Seidel, um, Dr. Josh Bowen, you know, they're already, you know, ready to, you know, come talk and uh, you know, being friends of mine. So, you know, those, awesome. those types of things. So what Jesse's describing is a lot of resources and partners. Um, your organization can build relationships with other nonprofits, can build them with other clubs on campus, um, local national organizations get like the fact you're here at a secular student Alliance thing is you've now networked and have friendships and partnership with a national organization. This one likes you so much that they will throw money and resources at you if you ask, right? Like they will help you fundraise. They will give you stickers. They will give you their time and let you pick their brain. This is the best one you can have. But there are other organizations like them. Jesse mentioned many of them. Uh, Freedom from Religion Foundation, FFRF. They are a legal advocacy organization. So if there's ever a separation of church and state issue you face on campus, they'll do the lawsuit for you. Um, they'll stick a bunch of lawyers on the case. Um, American Atheist, this is a human rights organization. <clears throat> it's been around for about 50 years. Uh, they do a lot of like policy work. So if you want to pass a law, maybe you want to make all hospitals secular in your state. I don't know. I'm just dreaming laws right now. If you want to make it illegal for Catholics to own church, uh, not churches, <laughs> for Catholics to own hospitals in your state, for instance, um, and you wanted to write that law and get it passed, you would probably work with an organization like American Atheists. Um, there's American Humanist Association, which is a, another national organization. They work with a lot of social justice partners on like climate change advocacy, court reform, um, so they can connect you to partners. They also can get you a lot of speakers. Um, Americans United for Separation of Church and State is like FFRF, but more broad. They work with a huge religious coalition on everything separation of church and state, including media and culture. Um, they like have a ton of pastors that they work with in a way that like FFRF mostly works with the atheist community. Um, and I use atheists interchangeably with humanists and secular. Uh, so I apologize. I work for an atheist organization right now, so I use the A word a lot. But if I was working for a humanist organization, I'd call them all humanist. Uh, they're most, there are technical differences, but for our case, we're going to call them interchangeable. Um, yeah, partnerships are great. I really recommend you like get to know the other clubs on campus. Um, I know like Laura, last time we talked, you were talking about the Democrat club. I think you were getting close with awesome start. You're going to find a lot of value alignment. Um, uh, my, I went to a, a private religious school. I went to California Lutheran University. And I say religious. It's not like Liberty University religious. It's more like Notre Dame religious. It's like um, actually not too bad. But there were a ton of religious clubs on my campus. And I was able to partner with the Catholics on a thing. And I was able to partner with the Lutherans on a thing. And I partnered with the Buddhists on a thing. Um, so depending on what you're trying to do, you could probably find partners. Like you could have an interfaith party. You could... Um, you could do a like religion and politics symposium and suddenly invite the Republican and Democratic Party groups or something. Um, so the ideas are endless once you like basically think of somebody you think might be an interesting partner and then come up with the event. Um, come up with the, the sexy title for a talk that you think people will attend. But um, as long as you can find somebody cool to work with and you know that they share the values you have, like the, the end goals you have, you should be able to find a way to work with them. There's something in the chat. 
just really quick, there are groups out there like Catholics for Choice. You know, these are people that kind of have your values and are religious practices, you know, so maybe find groups like that that exist on campus. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I, I do really want to emphasize that whether you like it or not, groups will almost always look like their leaders. And I don't mean look like, like if it's a white leader, it's going to be a white group. What I mean by is like whatever the activities and priorities and things that the way the group kind of communicates will often look like the leader. Um, so I find that like when groups are led by 80 year olds, they rarely have t a lot of 20 year olds in them. Uh, when groups are led by 20 year olds, they often don't have a lot of 80 year olds in them. Um, and that's not bad, right? Your group understands its target audience. Uh, if you're in your 20s, you'll plan the beach volleyball day more than the bingo night. Um, and that's okay. Uh, you're understanding the needs and priorities of the group you're trying to address. So don't be everything to everyone. Um, it's okay if you and all your friends really like to like do chess and philosophy and that's what your events become. Like, okay. Um, somebody wants to create the we dance and hike group and that's not what you do like let them create that support them partner with them on a political project but you don't have to be everything to everyone uh do what makes you exciting think about your friends and what excites them and you will build cool stuff um and if it's only for five people it's only for five people again we don't have to solve community for everyone the fact you provide a community for five people means you change those five people's lives that's important that's valuable I know uh, it looked like uh, uh, Colby was going to say something earlier. Uh, yeah, I, I put put my question. Can you oh. hear me? Yeah. Yeah, I put my question in the chat. We had initially um, for our first meeting, like 40 people actually joined the group through the campus thing. About a yes. dozen attended. However, whenever we um, put together group chat to say, okay, this is where we're going to talk about future events and stuff and meeting times. Um, we don't really have anyone talking. Me and oh. the president of have tried to, to get conversations started, but they don't really go anywhere. I got a really good tip for this. Uh, don't let anyone leave the meeting without talking. And the way you do that is by always having an introduction. Um, we actually did that today. You all had to introduce yourself before we went. And you basically broke the seal of conversation. Um, we've all been to an event where there's a speaker on stage. You walk in, you sit down, you don't talk to anyone, you watch the speaker, and then you leave. It's kind of sucks. Like, there's nothing social about that. Um, but you've also probably gone to a meeting where somebody says, okay, we're all going to introduce ourselves and we're going to say our name and we're going to say like the goofiest gift we've ever gotten. And we're going to talk about what major we have. And like, it feels meaningless, but having suddenly being able to use your voice with all of these people and having to share something personal, you are a real person. Now you're no longer a number in the crowd. You are a very real person and you've practiced speaking in the space. So speaking again is 10 times easier. Um, if the first time you have to speak in the group is to suddenly like answer a deep existential question or like address the direction of the group and you've never spoken in that group before, way too high a barrier. Um, if you're shy and you're new, that's that's so hard to do. Uh, I'm a super confident person and I don't like to do that. If I start quiet and I make it to the end mostly quiet, I'm going to be quiet through the whole thing. So get people like basically like break the seal. Um, you you want to get people talking in the beginning. And encourage a little dialogue when that happens. So when they share that, you know, their favorite gift they ever got was a, a blanket from their parents when they were a kid and they used to chew on it, like interact with that, you know, like talk to them about, oh, I had a blanket too, but, you know, our dog destroyed it or something like whatever your interaction with it is. Now you're both human beings. Um, I've had people when I ran a student group who attended meetings and never learned each other's names, but they remembered the little stories from the question I would ask at the beginning. I would ask like, what's your favorite road trip food? Like dumb questions like that, like team builder type questions. Um, and, you know, somebody said like, you know, really old beef jerky or something and they couldn't remember their name, but they would remember that's the beef jerky person. If they see them on campus two weeks later, they'll remember they're the people who like beef. I have something I can start a conversation with them. So I really, really encourage always having some type of like icebreaker or, you know, again, I, 
people are triggered by these words, team builder, icebreaker. So don't use that if you don't like that language, but uh, break the seal of conversation. Don't let anyone enter the space without having to engage a little. I even would stop meetings when new people would come in and go, hey, I, we all went around. I know we just started, but I'm going to give you two seconds. Where are you from? What's your major? What's your favorite road trip food? Um, boom, they're now in the conversation. Um, so I really encourage that. Uh, another thing you can do is create a uh, social space in your event. So a lot of our events become like a working event. We're going to like try to accomplish something or a discussion event. We're going to like hit this topic really hard. Um, and we can actually have like, a, you know, hey, we're going to get started in 15 minutes. Um, but the first 15 minutes is like coffee, donuts and getting to know each other. And you can like hand out name tags and introduce yourself and have a bit more of like a welcome party, hit new people. Um, and so you as a leader now can force them to break that seal by just introducing yourself um, because you created space for it. So those are my two tips. Uh, just, yeah, never let people leave without saying something. I notice those are the ones that don't come back. Um, if you can get them to speak, they've, yeah. I'm trying to think, anyone else have any other tips for kind of getting people talking? Uh, engaging, participating. I guess uh, one other thought I would mention is just uh, this also gets to some of the points you talked about earlier about like accessibility and stuff. Um, you know, the small things I've noticed can make a difference, you know, like uh, uh, reaching out on something like Discord as opposed to, um, you know, doing it on Facebook. Uh, also where you physically, uh, have the location, um, Evan was talking about different spaces on campus. If you were, if you first meeting was at a coffee shop, which is on one side of campus, that might've been a barrier for some people that you didn't know. But if you have a library in the middle of campus, everyone knows it really well. You've got big fountains in front of the library. You say, have our next meeting at that fountain in front of the library, right in the middle of campus. Uh, that like those things could make a difference. So that all of a sudden more people are there then you'd start that conversation early. You know, people are going to want to be more chatty. That alone is going to make a huge difference. I highly recommend like very public spaces for your first few meetings. Um, you know, I think sometimes we're like, oh, well, this is like a really safe group and it's mostly my friends. So we'll throw our meeting in my room or like this classroom on the second floor rather than like an open space in the student union or a, like in the park near the cafeteria. Um, the more you can make it accessible, the more people can try it out. The more people can like, oh, I'm going to like see what it's like, you know, kind of vibe check it before they they sit in on your meeting. Um, they also will feel less bad if they have to leave, um, where if it's in your room, there's like all of these norms we have in our society about being rude um, and they'll feel locked in like they can't leave without it being a big deal. Um, so that's another thing I also do is I try to have like a set endpoint for the meeting you kind of tell people, hey, we're going to do this for an hour and then we're going to break. And you're super passionate. People are going to stay. They're going to want to keep talking. They're going to keep hanging out. But the people who might have to go, you just gave them permission to leave. It's no longer awkward or upsetting for them to like walk out in the middle of people talking. Um, just and that's you as a leader have to do that. Hey, we just hit nine o'clock. We're going to pause for a second. We're going to get back to work in five minutes for anyone that stays. But I know you might have a big assignment due. And if you got to go, you got to go. Like we understand it. Um, but you've like, you've given people permission to be themselves, <laughs> uh, to prioritize their needs. And, uh, people appreciate that a lot. So, yeah, I like, I like to give people whenever possible, like an outline of what we're going to do in the beginning, like set expectations and then stick to those expectations. If you say we're going to talk for an hour and then we're going to break, and then you talk for two hours, like, you lied to them. <laughs> Actually stop at that hour, go, hey, we're pausing. I Usually we hang out and talk longer. I want to talk longer. If anyone wants to stay, I'm going to be here. Um, but if you got to go, you got to go. And like, I find most people stay uh, a lot of the time. They like the conversation too. Uh, if you're, you're good people, good vibes. It's all about the good vibes. All right. Did I miss anything in the chat? Wrote me. Uh, yes, somebody wrote me in the chat about being comfortable with silence. Um, this is actually something 
that's really important. Um, I'm a trained facilitator and we practiced this when I was trained as a facilitator. It's like, if you ask a question and everyone sits in silence for a few seconds, that's okay. Sit in that silence. Um, let them think. They're allowed to think. And sometimes you ask a question that's uncomfortable. Let them be uncomfortable. You just made the question 10 times deeper by letting them sit in that silence. Um, you know, you can then reframe the question uh, and then like there might be more silence, but it is okay to uh, basically use encouragement rather than like calling on people. Um, and if you can't get anyone speaking, you can eventually go, hey, um, you know, uh, you brought this up earlier. What's your thought? Or you're, is anyone new here? Suddenly you've just singled it out to the new people. Um, is there anyone new here who would like to comment? Pause for a few seconds, right? There's all these different ways to kind of get people engaged without specifically going like you, your turn, you speak. And now they feel pressured. They feel forced rather than uh, encouraged. Um, so yeah, I do think there is a beauty in sitting in the silence sometimes, which is super uncomfortable, but super worth it. Uh, especially like an ethical question. I love that dropping an ethical dilemma and then just letting people sit with it. Um, I find those are the meetings. My best meetings when I was a student leader is where I would ask a question that I knew was like what I'm going to call existential, a deep question that they had to grapple with. Usually they'd sit and grapple with a bit. And then whoever answered first, I would play devil's advocate. Um, even if I agreed with them, I would force them to keep thinking about it. And what I found is when they left the meeting feeling like they thought really hard, I addressed the need they had. They had a need to like explore deep ideas in a safe group of people, um, right? Like if you want help with that, I'm sure the SSA staff can give you a ton of ideas. I have a bunch from my days like, you know, should children be allowed at protests? Um, you might be like, yeah, children should be able to do what they want. Well, people force children to represent their views at protests all the time. And we hate seeing that like, I don't like when Christians force their children to be at protests to be pro-life. Why is it okay when we do it, right? Like, and just keep playing devil's advocate and you're going to get to the deepest part of that concept. Um, it's good. Circle a concept 10 times and you're going to get people, uh, doing, they'll now think harder about it. They'll think about it when they go home. They'll think about it next week. They might bring it back at your next meeting. That can be fun if you're doing discussion meetings. <clears throat> But I, that's what I like to facilitate. Again, lean into your strengths. If you don't want to facilitate ethical conversations because you don't feel like you're going to do well with those, uh, do something else. Say, we're going to organize the counter protest to that street preacher who keeps saying that I shouldn't have equal rights. Like, that's awesome. Go do that. Whatever you're good at. Remember, we're organizing for people, not just ideas. Um, even when I have meetings that are just around ideas, I'm thinking about how it will help the people grow. Um, this is a common misperception that I think religious people and atheists fall into. They think they like, we're trying to get people to learn about atheism or theism. And I'm like, that's so fucking boring. Like, whatever, you figure that out, then what? Then the really juicy ethical questions come up. Like, how do you raise people with or without religion? How do you fight climate change with or without a perspective on the afterlife? How do you uh, organize to help people in community or not, like if they get sick at the hospital, right? How do we build rituals that actually help people rather than hurt people? How do we design a society that like can challenge cult leaders rather than support them? I don't fucking know the answers to those, but those are really juicy questions. <laughs> okay, what else we got? Let's do another like five minutes. Uh, Andrew asks, how do you overcome shyness and really engage as a leader? Um, this is probably practice. It's like, how do you become a public speaker? Like the only answer you're ever going to hear from public speakers is practice. Um, you're just going to have to keep trying. Um, what I will say as an organizer is you don't have to be everything to everyone. Just like your group doesn't have to be everything to everyone. You as a leader doesn't have to be everything to everyone. Uh, I really encourage you to build a team. Um, I'm a super cocky, outgoing guy who thinks I can do anything because I'm a white male moving through the world. But uh, I learned very quick, uh, like the people that were much better at things than me in college. So I have this friend, Sam. Um, he, for some reason, can bring five new people to every meeting we had. 
like I've never met anyone like this in my life. He's just like so enthusiastic. People love being around him and he has no problem asking you to do something if he thinks it's cool. And so he, anytime he'd move through the week, he would just be like, oh, you guys would love the Secular Student Alliance meeting. You should check it out. Oh, you want to come with me? And like, he would just have conversations like that throughout the week constantly with people um, that I couldn't, you know, I, I would struggle to have that conversation with people. Um, I would feel, would feel like a salesman, like, oh yeah, you should really come. And nah, here's why X, Y, Z, why we're the best group on campus. And people would be weirded out. He would bring like two or three new people every meeting. But you know, what he couldn't do is organize the damn meetings, you know, like he couldn't uh, send out the reminders on a regular basis. He couldn't organize an agenda and keep people on it. He couldn't facilitate play devil's advocate on a hard conversation. He just wanted to be the thinker. Um, I learned that I had skills that he didn't and he had skills that I didn't. And we worked really well together in that sense. Um, you know, like you don't have to be the enthusiastic people, but you probably have people in your network who will like what you're doing. If you have a good vision who maybe can be that for you. Um, so I think one of the best choices you can make is decide maybe you're not the face of the organization. Um, that's okay. You still might run everything. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, often like the really uh, outgoing people are the ones that like lead a lot of conversations or the one that do the public speaking. You should practice that. It's a great skill. I encourage you to do it, but it doesn't have to be you all the time. Um, you can ask somebody and say, this is a strength you have. I'd like to work with you on this, or I'd like you to do this. And they'll tell you yes or no. Um, I've met some professional marketings in my consulting days. And one of my favorite things I ever learned from a professional marketer, um, when I was asking like, well, how often should I write people or text people as we're trying to sell them this thing? And he's like, as much as possible. Um, you're trying to get to a fuck yes or a fuck no from somebody. Anything in between is worthless. Um, and that sounds annoying, right? Like, oh, so I'm going to harass someone until they tell me fuck off or yes. But yeah, like people are indecisive until they're not. And our goal as organizers is to figure out where they are on that spectrum. Um, we want to know if they're going to join or if they're not. They're not very helpful to us in the middle. Um, religious people actually do this quite impressively. I've met like uh, a religious professor who loves debates because it gets people off the fence. It makes them be fuck yes or fuck no about religion. And he's like, I want to work with the kids who actually care. I hate the kids in the middle who won't make up their mind that are so agnostic. It's frustrating. And the kids who are on the opposite side, I don't have to worry about. Um, you're the same thing as a leader in, to some extent, right? Like you want to know if they're attending your event or not. And you need to give people the autonomy to say no. You need to give them the option to say no. Like trust them. They will say no if they don't want to participate. And that's okay. A no is not a bad answer. A no is just a different decision. Um, and you're not actually giving them that opportunity unless you ask them, unless you make them choose. Um, so I really encourage you to constantly ask questions like, are you attending? Um, can I count on you? Will you take on this leadership thing? And they might hem and haw. You will keep asking. Uh, and they will tell you if they don't want you to ask anymore. That's okay. Um, that's really honest conversation. <laughs> But if you don't ask because you're afraid and they won't answer because they're afraid, that's a really dishonest conversation. <clears throat> also, uh, Sierra had a question uh, in the chat about uh, meetings that you might be able to help with. Uh, so the meeting in a coffee shop, that one? Yeah. All right. So would it be a good idea for me to hold my meet and greet at a coffee house that is downtown in the middle of both campuses? within driving distance for students of both campuses. So uh, tell me a little bit more about the campus situation you're dealing with. So um, in this area of Augusta, North Augusta, we've got the Somerville campus, which is where I mainly am. And then you have the uh, medical district, medical campus, that is more downtown. So is driving distance. difference between the students? Like they're just yes. medicine and just, in both cases, so it, are they residential? Um, there are dorms. I don't know if there are dorms on my campus, uh, but there are dorms literally on the other campus. Uh, I think those are the only dorms, actually. Okay. Um, so there are buses for people who don't have cars that go back and forth. Uh, I don't know if they go to just downtown in general or not. Um, the downtown campus is 
the medical district. So it's got like nursing and medical students. And my campus has a lot of education, fine arts, and uh, the people like that, like writing and stuff like that. Uh, basically everything other than the, the other stuff. Um, so it, there is a difference in the people, but, you know, we're, we're kind of all everything. Um, yeah. So driving distance between the two um, is like a good 10 minutes. And most students um, have cars? I'd say most do. I see a fair amount on the buses. Um, but for the most part, a lot of students have cars. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, you're asking an accessibility question and what I like to do is try to make it as easy as possible for people to attend. Um, so like somebody's going to, it's going to be harder to attend. They're going to have to sit on a bus for a while or they're going to have to get in their car, drive somewhere, park, uh, go to your meeting, drive home when they're done. Um, this is why I found like uh, my campus wasn't much of a commuter campus. And I found that when we held events off campus, people who lived on campus wouldn't really go. And when I held them on campus, the commuters wouldn't really come. Um, people want to go home after school when they're a commuter. So this is just like, because it's accessibility. It's kind of like how much energy and time do you have? Do you want to hang out two hours after class to go to a club meeting? If you're a commuter, nah, you're probably just going to go home and watch YouTube. Um, so uh yeah, I think you're going to have to figure that out. What I will say is prioritize the group that is like most important, meaning most likely to attend or you think you're going to build your group around. And if most of them are like, we're on the liberal arts campus and we're not going to leave much, like, all right, just decide it's mostly for them. And you can market to the other campus, but, um, and vice versa. You know, like I do find trying to stereotype based on like major rarely works. Um, you're going to have people who want to explore deep ideas in all majors and you have people who care about political issues in all majors. Um, they're going to approach it differently, uh, but you're going to find, uh, interest from all types. Um, so yeah, I don't really know. That's, I think you're the only one that could probably answer that because it's more context sensitive. Um, but it's a, it's a good question. It's worth exploring. And then, uh, another thing that you could do is just check out all the other clubs and see how they handle it. Um, learn from the people who have already failed. Uh, you know, go ask some other leaders if, how they've thought about this. Maybe they haven't. Uh, maybe they have. You know, I, there's probably people in student life who work with the clubs who like know what has been the normal thing people do for the past 10 years. Um, they might have some tips and tricks. Yeah, you have what's weird about college campuses. Is you have all of these like paid staff and professors who have been there much longer than the students who have so much knowledge that nobody asks them. Um, just literally approach one and go, hey, here's a thing I'm working on. Like, what do you think? And these people love talking like they're they're professional student wranglers, right? Like they they got hired to help you with your life. Um, and usually they're curious. They interact with the university. They like big questions. And if you introduce an interesting problem to them or you say you can help me with a thing that might align with your values. Yeah, I find professors and staff are super helpful. Um, and if you find a terrible one, now you know. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I didn't run into too many hostile ones, even at a religious school. So I doubt you're going to run into too many. But if you do, um, that's good knowledge. You at least know that there might be some hostile staff and you guys can, you all can plan around that. Um, but yeah, I would assume the best going into conversations with these people. Uh, you'd be surprised what you can get out of them. Sometimes they'll help you navigate finding money. They'll help you find space. Maybe they'll let you promote some of their classes. Maybe they'll partner with you on events. You have no idea how much knowledge is hiding in them until you ask. Yeah, God, me as, as a senior was so much smarter about how campus worked from my freshman year. Like, unbelievable how much more I knew about campus and how to navigate bureaucracy and how many resources were available and how clubs operate in just three or four years. And like some of those staff have been there 15, 20 years. Um, so do not be afraid to ask them. Cool. Any last questions? Let's see chat. Talking about undergrad days. I know, I know. We he can't talk about those yesterday anymore.
All right. Well, I want to thank you all for attending. This has been really fun. Um, you have my contact info. If you ever have questions, shoot me an email. Um, I literally had a, there's a leader at Harvard who just started a group and he found a talk I did online and just like cold messaged me on Instagram. We had a phone call by that night and I was giving him a bunch of ideas. Like I cannot emphasize how accessible I will make myself if you need help. Um, and I would encourage you to try to write other secular leaders that way. Um, you're in this weird moment in life where people like me will bend over backwards to try to help you. <laughs> we won't always be this kind. Um, so use it while you can. All right. Thank you all.